Chapter Eight of the Directory of the Devout Life by F. B. Meyer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mary Ann. Chapter Eight, The Rule of the Eye, Matthew Chapter Five, Verse Twenty Eight. We have already seen that if a man permits his heart to be filled with anger that perpetually boils over or explodes in hard and contemptuous expressions he is excluded from the kingdom of heaven and cast away as a useless the fire of gehenna being a well-known expression for the rubbish heap we are now led a step further and taught that impurity may have the same terrible effect unless its earliest motions be sternly repressed indeed christ teaches that what is as natural as a right hand or eye may unless rigorously ruled become the cause of the whole body being cast into gehenna the outward and inward the expression of the body and the passionate desire of the lower region of the soul which we might call the animal soul act and react on each other the former influences the latter as the pouring of oil arouses a smothered flame on the other hand through the combination of desire and imagination contriving together in the dark caverns of the soul the body may become the instrument of deeds that make the pure stars blush the legislatures of the old time laid it down that no member of the commonwealth should commit adultery and enacted terrible penalties if their prohibitions were trampled under foot deuteronomy chapter twenty two verse twenty four but the divine man who reads the heart of man goes back behind the deed to its premonitory stages legislates about the look that may inflame passion and condemns the soul that does not instantly turn the eye from that which allures it to the all-holy asking to be cleansed not with tears only but with blood and pleading that the eye henceforth may be filmed with pity melted into tenderness and set on fire with the light of his eyes that are described as being like a flame of fire the importance of the regimen of the eye is acknowledged in many places of scripture when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes lot saw the plain of sodom it was to david's straying glances that his great sin was due second samuel chapter eleven verse twelve the psalmist asked that his eyes may be turned away from beholding vanity job made a covenant with his eyes and the wise man tells us not to look upon the wine when it is red and giveth its color in the cup each passage enforces our lord's words the first step in the religious life is to detect right and wrong not in the act but in the thought and intention if sin is arrested there it is arrested at its earliest stage when the inward senses are exercised and trained to discern good and evil and when the soul not only discerns but resists there is no fear of life being mastered by the tempter the snake is killed in the egg the microbe is destroyed before it can breed the enemy is defeated before he can become ensconced within the city walls it is a remarkable fact to how small an extent many professing christians practice this discernment between things that differ they will be quite willing to admit that the soul has senses duplicated with those of the body that it has eyes with which it may see god ears by which it may hear the inner voice the sense of touch and even of smell by which to distinguish between the wholesome and the corrupt between the air of paradise and the breath of the pit but they have never learned to exercise them to note and act upon their earliest suggestion hebrews chapter five verse fourteen this is the case of infinite failure and keeps such christians in the stage of babyhood they never become full-grown nor partake of the solid food of the word compare also first corinthians chapter three verses one and two a curious illustration of this happened to me once a christian lady was very anxious that i should read a certain novel which had just come out and was attracting wide interest she assured me that i should find much that i would approve of and enjoy acting on her advice i took the book to beguile some leisure hours on the atlantic and sat down one afternoon on my deck chair to enjoy it when however i reached page fifty i flung it into the ocean as i thought its contents could injure the fishes less than myself if i had continued to read that story i should have been playing with fire what made the difference between that christian lady and myself was it not that my inner senses were more sensitive than hers 
and able to discern the evil of the book which she would have unwittingly permitted to poison and contaminate her entire nature some of us have quicker natural senses than others the coast guardsman accustomed to survey the ocean will detect a tiny boat which would escape the notice of the average landsman the experienced eye of the scout will build up a whole volume of useful information from the examination of a footstep or even a handful of ash which would be of no service to the ordinary traveller similar differences hold in the realm of the soul and many receive poison into their systems almost before they are aware it is therefore of the utmost importance to exercise the soul in the discriminations of the inner sense and to accustom it to act on its findings and this was probably in the mind of our lord when he spoke so earnestly about the rule of the eye too accustomed to move carelessly over faces and forms on the spectacle of human and natural life as it passes in ceaseless panorama before us it would not have been easy to speak to all the world about the senses of the soul men would not for the most part have understood him but if he could only teach them that there might be sin in a look and that the unregulated look might lead to sin it would be one step at least towards awakening the soul to watchfulness against those first yieldings to temptation which reveal themselves not only in the glance of the eye but in the inner movement of the soul let a man begin to guard his looks he will end by keeping his heart beyond all else that he keeps since he has come to see that out of it are the issues of life we must learn most of all to conquer passionate desire the appetites which god has implanted within us for food for sleep for human love and such like things are not in themselves wrong but they are very liable to get wrong in two directions either we may desire a right thing too passionately and for the mere pleasure it affords rather than for the service it will enable us to do to others or we may desire satisfaction from an object which for good reasons is placed outside the circumference of our life the presence of such an object may excite the passionate desire of our nature and if it should our lord says we must not look on it in this case the old proverb out of sight out of mind is our only safeguard what the eye does not see the heart will be less likely to desire the master goes further and says that if we are brought into almost constant contact with an object that tempts us and if we cannot conquer its inevitable fascination upon our temperament it would be better for us to pluck it out and cast it away though it were precious as an eye and useful as a foot of course the best policy would be to acquire such an elevation and strength of soul that we should be superior to the temptation of any wrong or hurtful snare when a child is well fed it will not fight with dogs for the garbage of the streets when we come from standing on the transfiguration mount with the light of its recent glory on our faces we shall find no attractions in the vanities of vanity fair but failing that and as the next best thing it were wiser like joseph of old to leave our garment and flee refusing even to be in the same room with the temptress at whatever cost however we must learn to master the desire of our senses and not allow our feet to wander in the direction they solicit unless it be one which god himself has marked out for us even then we must tread in it with moderation such as is imposed on the one side by the remembrance that every good and perfect gift is the father's gift and therefore to be used reverently and on the other by the fear lest we should injure another and forget that in every act we must conquer the well-being of all around us paramount to our own enjoyment it must be of course always borne in mind that sin is not to be imputed to the body it is not the eye that sins but the heart that uses it for sin it is not the body that yields itself to the entrance of evil things but the soul that turns the key unlocks the door and permits them to enter no doubt the body is a weight in the heavenly race because in its subtle nervous mechanism it carries the record and impulse of many acts of unrestrained evil on the part of our ancestors it is a chain whose links have been forged by many separate acts which have grown into habits but the ultimate power is always invested in the spirit which must always utter its i will or its i will not before an act can be done which has any moral quality in it of which we must give an account and which is either a step upward to heaven or downward to the pit if you sin it is not your body that sins 
but you through your body, and you are transforming into a pigsty what God made for his palace and temple. Strong as heredity may be, Christ is stronger. Vehement as the steeds are, which are yoked to the chariot of life, the beneficent Creator would never have given them to you except that he knew that you were well able, with his grace helping you, to rein them in, and compel them to keep the course, and run the race, and win the goal. If, then, you want to arrest acts of sin in the body, it is imperative that you should deal with the inward sense and with the desires of the mind. How, then, can we purify the desires of the mind? 1. We must guard against the first tiny thought of evil. The microbes float in the air, and if at any time we are off our guard and allow them to alight, they will infallibly find a nest in which to breed. The Holy Spirit, if we entrust him with the sacred task, will make us very sensitive when the tiniest speck of evil is floating towards us, and will remind us to shelter under the blood. Men may shrink from our using that mystic word, but, believe me, there is no other infallible talisman of victory. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb. 2. We must avoid the occasions of temptations. It is useless to ask God not to lead us into temptation if we thrust ourselves thither. I had once to advise a young artist to give up painting figures, because it was impossible for him to go through the training which is held to be necessary without being overmastered by temptations incident to that line of study. It was the right foot, but it always made him stumble, and it had to go. At another time I had no alternative but to advise a young girl to break away from an attachment dear to her as life, because she could not continue it without serious spiritual danger. It was the right eye, but it had to be plucked out. But are these losses without compensation? Nay, verily. It is impossible to give up such things for Christ without receiving a hundredfold in this present life. When Milton's eyes were closed on the scenes of earth, they were opened on the throne of God and the Lamb. We are completed in Him. We go maimed into life. 3. We must appropriate the opposite grace. It is good, but it is not enough to turn the eyes away from beholding vanity, or to shut them, as the aesthetic might do, from all that is right and natural and innocent. There is something better, supplied by the universal principle, which we are using throughout these chapters. Love. When our hearts are filled with love, the eyes will not gaze on an object for selfish enjoyment. They will look on the interests of another, will see all the agony and pain that may ensue if that other is turned away, as poor Bathsheba was, from the path of unsullied righteousness, will fill with tears at the very thought of bringing shame and dishonor into another's life, will become tender with a holy and selfless love, will be yielded as organs of Christ's own vision, and, out of all that, will come the transparency of a pure heart which the Holy Spirit shall make his abiding place. Who among us shall dwell in the everlasting burnings of the divine purity? He that shutteth his eyes from looking upon evil, he shall dwell on high. Isaiah chapter 33, verses 14 to 16, Revised Version. End of chapter 8